next summer I will be doing my niece's wedding, and so I'm now looking around at all this wedding stuff that, that normally just sort of escapes my attention. This morning on Instagram, there was a, a little video of a wedding in Bosnia where the bride and the groom are coming out of a house, and the bride is heavily veiled, I and mean, she can't even see where she's going. And there are all these people outside who, in the custom of that part of the world, are firing pistols into the air. Uh, and at one point, somebody hands the bride a pistol, and she fires it into the air, too. And they, do you wonder where those bullets are kind of come back down? But it, in fact, she couldn't even see would perhaps have made me a little reluctant to give her any sort of weapon. But I guess that was their odd custom, and apparently no one was injured in the making of that wedding. It's odd sometimes how something that we know and is very familiar can seem strange in the way that other people take it and make it their own. Uh, it would have probably seemed very logical to Jesus and to the people he was speaking to originally the way this wedding is described in the, the parable this morning. But it seems odd to us until we unpack it and then try to figure out what in the world it might mean for us now, even now. So we begin with the idea that the, the bridegroom is going to come and collect the bride. I mean, he, the, the bride and the groom typically lived in their own family compounds, houses, and only really met probably at the time of the wedding. And since transportation was complicated and things were unpredictable then as much as they are now, even more than they are now, who could be sure when the bridegroom was going to come? I mean, the, the, the time of the wedding was a pretty nebulous concept because nobody wore a watch anyway. So was the bridegroom going to come in the middle of the day or in the evening or the middle of the night or maybe with the next day or the day after if he some, was delayed for some reason? So you can imagine there must have been a certain amount of fluster in the bride's family house and household not knowing exactly when this guy is going to show up, not knowing exactly when they're going to have to provide suitable hospitality, but knowing that this, this event is going to come and there being a certain sense of excitement that this is about to happen. And yet, as we see in this case, as probably was often the case in reality, things get a little more complicated as the story goes on. Then there, there are all these bridesmaids. I mean, somebody commented on the way out of church on Sunday that it sounds, seems like an awful lot of bridesmaids. I've done a couple of weddings in my career where there were bridal parties that large. Now, it is difficult, even in a room this size, to get everybody lined up on either side and make it look halfway symmetrical, but there's a partly uh, more complicated reason for why there would have been so many bridesmaids. I mean, you may know that even in European cultures until fairly recently, it was a sort of Miss America system. If the bride was unable to get married for some reason, the, groom, the bridegroom married one of the bridesmaids instead. Uh, you know, if the first runner-up has to assume the duties of Miss America, it's to complete the analogy. Uh, the, bri the bridegroom was not going to go back to his own house without a wife. He was going to get one one way or another. And so you might suppose that having more bridesmaids would be good because he would have more to choose from and you as the bride's family would be more certain that you would have met your obligation to somehow provide a wife for this person from this other family. So lots of bridesmaids and one of them might well have to step in kind of on short notice and fill in for the bride. But you had to be present to win. It really doesn't seem logical that the bridegroom would choose one of the bridesmaids, should that uh, need arise, who wasn't there. Well, you know, I, I have these, these five here. I can choose from among them or someone I've never even seen and have no conception of. Well, it seems pretty clear which one he's going to choose. So there is something about hanging around and making sure you're in the right place at the right time in this case, just in case something like that comes up. I mean, I'm sure that readers of, careful readers of the Bible, particularly of the Gospels, to say nothing of Jane Austen, will know what sort of preoccupation being married was necessarily for young women. I mean, it was not merely more comfortable, it was safer to be married than to not be. So... There are all these people hanging around thinking, well, maybe it's going to be my turn now. You know, usually, and hopefully it wouldn't be. We don't want the bride to suddenly be you know, taken dead. Uh, but I suppose that might occasionally have happened. Well, who knows? All of that is all very well, and it makes an interesting anthropology lesson, particularly given the, the way that marriage has evolved in our culture and the way that we handle it now. But I think it also does say things to us that are current about our own faith. And we can't just look at it as being a quaint story about how people used to do things. 
there is the, the beginning of not knowing exactly when the bridegroom is going to come, not knowing exactly when God is going to act. It's true in the usual sort of apocalyptic revelation sense of the end times and everything in the universe ending and so forth, and not knowing precisely when that will happen. But it's equally important as we go through our lives to remember that it applies to us in every moment of our lives also. We don't know when God is going to come to us, each one of us, individually or collectively, and, and move powerfully in us. It's not just about everything ending, it's also about everything progressing. Somehow the kingdom of God continues to be built in us and through us and sometimes despite us in the world. All the more important to be aware that we don't know exactly when that may come to any one of us. I know I'm one of those people who likes to have everything planned and everything carefully arranged, and I like to have details worked out in advance. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the spreadsheets I have every time I go on vacation, but that's a whole other story. It's a good lesson to me, preaching to myself as much as to anybody else, that there are times when God comes along and switches off the spreadsheets. He says, yeah, you thought that's what you were going to do, but this is what you're actually going to do. So there's that piece of it that certainly still applies to us and is worth meditating on frequently in our lives, especially when we think we have everything figured out and everything carefully nailed down. I suspect that God has a sense of humor in those moments, and that is why God chooses to act sometimes in those moments. Then there's the question of, of which bridesmaid gets chosen. It's hard for us as modern people, and again here, I suppose by us, I mean me, and by modern people, I mean people who aren't very patient, to be patient. I never have to wait for much of anything. And I confess that I occasionally observe myself not being very graceful when I do have to wait for something. I think it's useful to remember that this story is telling us that there is something holy about waiting. I mean, it's very unlikely that the, bride, the bridegroom is going to manage somehow to, you know, kill off nine out of ten bridesmaids, as well as the bride. So chances are, in any one of those situations, you may not be the bridesmaid who ends up as the bride. That doesn't mean we don't still have to wait. That doesn't mean that that waiting isn't still holy. I think it also matters how we wait. And the bridesmaids are a, a company. I mean, they're, they're, they're together. They're, 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 there's a reason why in most weddings, the bridal party are all dressed alike. It's because they're all working on the same project. They all have the same goal. We also are called to wait somehow in a way that is collective. To be absent doesn't merely mean that, that, that you can't win. It also means that somehow the company is reduced in some way. A wedding banquet with five bridesmaids just isn't good, as good as a wedding banquet with ten bridesmaids. We as Americans tend to get a little bit too uh, caught up in our individuality, I think. It's a good reminder that there is something holy about waiting together, working together, achieving together, somehow fulfilling the purposes of God together even when it may seem like what we are doing is waiting and otherwise wasting time in the eyes of the world. I suspect that God does not see it the same way. So, you and I, dear friends, are bridesmaids each day, every day. There's never any guarantee that one of us will not end up as the bride. There's never any guarantee that being a bridesmaid is not enough for each one of us to do what it is that God intends us to do. So let's keep our lamps lit. Be ready when the bridegroom comes. Be ready to rejoice. Be ready to rejoice in everything that God accomplishes, whether it is directly through us or through us collectively or indeed through someone completely different. God is at work in the world. God is coming. We have only to stay awake and we will see it. Amen.